And I'm going to go on, if I can find it. with the, the chlamydia. We actually need more time for the chlamydia and the rickettsia, so I'm just going to continue on. Any questions on mycoplasmas? All right. The next group of organisms are called the, the chlamydia. And actually, these are members of the family of organisms called the chlamydiaceae. And again, there are two genuses within this, uh, this family that have human uh, pathogens in them. Uh, the genus Chlamydia, and the one organism here is Chlamydia trachomatis, causes urogenital tract infections. It causes an eye infection called trachoma, a milder eye infection, conjunctivitis. Uh, we can get, there can be a pneumonia in infants and a sexually transmitted disease called lymphogranuloma venerium, or LGV. The other genus is the genus chlamydophilia, and there are two pathogens in this group, the uh, C. cytosci, chlamydophilia cytosci, which causes a pneumonia, sometimes called cytokosis. Again, this is one of these atypical type pneumonias. And then C. pneumoniae, which causes a, primarily a bronchitis and a sinusitis, but can develop into a pneumonia. And there's also an interesting correlation with this organism and atherosclerosis that we'll talk about. Now, this breakdown of, of this family into these two genera uh, is a relatively recent occurrence. And I, th I think it was like around four, four years ago, maybe five years ago, that this, 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 this genus was created or identified. Uh, prior to that, these organisms were all classified under the genus Chlamydia. So don't be surprised if you hear people talking about chlamydia cytosci or chlamydia pneumoniae. Uh, this is re relatively new. And what I'm going to try to do is, is, is in, if I write you know, anything that we have in here and on these slides, I put both names. I put chlamydia philia cytosci and then parentheses chlamydia to remind you that you're going to probably hear. Most people are still referring to this as chlamydia cytosci, chlamydia pneumoniae. All right, so a little bit about their biology. These are small obligate intracellular parasites. So this is an intracellular parasite. And in fact, at one time, it was thought that these organisms were, in fact, viruses. Uh, if you look back in old microbiology texts, the chapters on the chlamydia were, were included in the virology section, and these were called the chlamydial viruses. But we know now, in fact, these are not viruses. They contain DNA, RNA, and ribosomes. And when, you, when Dr. Hunt comes in and, and talks to you about the viruses in, in, in her first introductory lecture on viruses, she's going to point out that viruses dis are distinguished from bacteria in the sense that uh, by viruses contain either DNA or RNA, but never both. And they don't contain ribosomes. Again, there's obviously, there's always going to be an exception. So there's one exception to that in the viruses. But these are true bacteria. They contain DNA and RNA and ribosomes. All right. These are gram-negative organisms. They have both an inner and an outer membrane, and they have an LPS. But one feature that's unique about these organisms, they don't contain peptidoglycan. Now notice, I didn't say they don't have a cell wall. They do have a cell wall. It's just not peptidoglycan. It's, it's really something that's not very well characterized. <coughs> And these organisms are obligate energy parasites. They can't make ATP, and that's why they have to live intracellularly. That's why they were intracellular pathogens. They actually parasitize and the host ATP sources and use the host ATP for their energy. They can't make their own. Now, these organisms come in two forms. There are the elementary bodies, or EBs, and this is the these are very small, 0.3 to 0.4 micron uh, particles. Uh, and this is the, actually the extracellular form of the organism. Obviously, there's got to be a time when this organism then passes from one cell to another cell. And so it goes through an extracellular phase. And it is this phase that is the extracellular form. And it is spore-like in the sense that it has a very rigid outer membrane. 
Now, I'm not saying they're spores because they're not produced like, is the way Dr. Fox you know, told you these spores are made. These are not spores, but they're spore-like in the sense that they have this very rigid outer membrane, and they, they res they're very resistant to harsh environmental conditions, and that's why they can live outside or they can survive outside the um, uh, cells that they normally infect. These forms, although they're, they can persist in the environment, they, do, they are not metabolically active, and, and they don't replicate. This is, this is an inert form of the organism. And, but it is the infectious form. And this is what we, we, our cells get infected with. And the cells that they infect primarily are columnar epithelial cells. But some of them actually can also f infect macrophages. But primarily, it's the, going to be the columnar epithelial cells that these cells that these organisms infect. We'll, we'll talk about the ones that infect macrophages later. The other form of the organism is referred to as the reticulate body, or RB. And these are larger, and this is the intracellular form. So when the uh, elementary body uh, infects, uh, then, the, then we get the formation of the reticulate body. And these are much more heavy. The membrane is more fragile because all the disulfide bonds that were involved in making that a very rigid outer membrane are broken down, or many of them are broken down, and becomes more metabolic, um, uh, more fragile, the membrane. But in this is the metabolically active form in the replicating form. This is the form that, that parasitizes the, the ATP from the cell. But they're not infectious. If you were to take a cell that was infected with, with the chlamydia and, and, and lice that cell and release the, the reticulate bodies, they will not be infectious. And the way we get this, so the, so the developmental cycle of these organisms is, is depicted in the following slides. The elementary bodies attach then to the cells that they're going to infect. And again, primarily epithelial cells, uh, but some of them infect macrophages. And then they're taken up by the cell, either by endocytosis or, if it's a macrophage, by phagocytosis, taking in the elementary body. And then once it's inside the cell, what these organisms do is they inhibit phagolysosome fusion. If you remember from uh, Dr. Fox's lecture yesterday, intracellular pathogens have three options. One of these options is to inhibit phagolysosome fusion, and that's what these organisms do. In fact, today and tomorrow when we cover the rickettsia, we'll cover all three of those lifestyles of the intracellular organisms. So this, this is the one that inhibits phagolysosome fusion. And then it just grows in the phagosome. And it reorganizes into this reticulate body. It breaks down those disulfide bonds that made that rigid outer membrane, and it converts into the reticulate body. And then the reticulate body is the, grow is the replicating form, and it just begins to replicate. Eventually, and it's not cl really clear why this happens, and we really don't know what, what triggers the, the conversion from the reticulate body back into the elementary body, but eventually, these reticulate bodies begin to reorganize into the elementary bodies. And we get in the cell these inclusion bodies, uh, if this will work, the, these inclusion bodies, which is basically that phagosome gets larger and larger and larger as these cells replicate it. And then they, all these reticulate bodies start converting into the elementary body. And you get these inclusion bodies in these cells. And this is important because that's actually going to be one of the things that's going to help in the diagnosis of these diseases is to actually look for those inclusion bodies. We'll talk about that when we get to the laboratory diagnosis. All right, and then these elementary bodies that are in, the, in these inclusion bodies are released. And how they get out can vary a little bit depending upon the organism. In the case of Cytosci, the, the cell just lyses and releases all these, these elementary bodies. In the case of trachomatis and pneumonia, this Inclusion body is just sort of extruded out of the cell, and then once it gets out into the environment, it, the, the inclusion body breaks, the membrane breaks, and, and uh, the elementary bodies are released for the next, to infect the next cell. Okay, these are the diseases that, we'll start with the, the treat uh, trachomatis, the chlamydia trachomatis group, and, and these are the diseases that it cause. It causes a number of dif different diseases. Trachoma. Trachoma is, a, is an infection of the eye, and it is actually the leading cause of blindness worldwide. Right? Uh, it, it also causes a milder eye disease called inclusion conjunctivitis, 
<laughs> in infants that can cause a pneumonia, there is an ocular form of this disease, uh, lymphogranuloma venereum. It causes, this organism causes urogenital tract infections. It's involved in, in Reiter's syndrome, and we'll talk about what Reiter's syndrome is shortly. And finally, that sexually transmitted disease, lymphogranuloma venereum. Now, these organisms are broken down into different groups based on their biological characteristics, and they're called biovars, biological variants. And there's three biovars within this, this group of organisms. These organisms are broken down into the trachoma bio, biovar, the LGV biovar, and the mouse pneumonitis biovar. Since none of you are going to ever be treating mice, we'll forget about that one. So for all practical purposes, we've got two biovars, the trachoma and the LGV biovar. Okay. Now, each of these biovars, then, is further subdivided into a, a number of serovars, which are serological variants. And these serological variants are based on, on antigenic properties of the major outer membrane protein. So we can make antibodies against different uh, outer membrane proteins to identify the different serovars. And the serovars are given letter designations, A through L. And, and there are particular disease associations with certain serovars. So for example, the A, B, and the C serovars are most commonly seen in causing the disease trachoma, whereas the D through K serovars, as well as, as the B serovar, these are involved in the ocular and genital diseases. The L serovars are the ones that cause the LGV. Okay, now I don't expect you, to, again, to remember a lot of these specifics about which, which serovars cause which. We'll be dealing primarily with the biovars. The biovar trachoma causing which, what diseases they cause, what, what, the, what diseases the LGV biovar uh, control. But just keep in mind that the serovars actually uh, are also associated with particular diseases. All right, so what... These cells, the pathogenesis of these diseases, these cells, as I said, infect columnar epithelial cells with, with the exception of some of them uh, infect the macrophages as well. And what they do, these are intracellular organisms, remember, and one of the things that they do is they downregulate class 1 MHC. So what's going to be the, the consequence of that? One? They're going to be, they're going to, this is a mechanism by which they evade killing by cytotoxic T cells, because cytotoxic T cells have to recognize class 1 MHC. All right, so they downregulate it, and this is one of the ways that they, they escape detection by the, the cytotoxic T cells. There's an inflammatory response in these infections, but the, and there are PMNs involved with this, but characteristically, there's, a, there's an influx of lymphocytes in these infections. So there's an inflammatory response, but it's a lymphocytic inflammatory response as well as some PMNs. And what happens is you get the formation in the infected tissues of actually lymphoid follicles form in, in the uh, infected area. <laughs> and, and these cells, of course, are, are dying in, uh, as the cells, as the infection progresses, and you get damage to the tissue, and then there's also scarring of the tissue, fibrosis of the tissue. So what you see in these infections are lymphoid follicle formations coupled with, with a lot of fibrosis. And the disease results then from the actual destruction of the cells as well as that immune response to those, to those uh, infected cells. But there's no long-lasting immunity to these infections. So we can get reinfected with these things. And what happens in these cases, either a chronic infection is established because we can't, get, we can't clear the organism, or we get repeated infections with this, and then there's just constant damage occurring to the tissues, and then ultimately there are, there are uh, more severe problems. All right? But we don't have any long-lasting immunity. All right, let's look at the epidemiology of these infections. And we'll start with the trachoma biovar, and, and talk first about the ocular infections. These infections occur worldwide, uh, but in fact, we don't see too much of it in this country. This, this, these infections are primarily associated with conditions of poverty and overcrowding. 
And so you see this, these infections endemic in, in places like Africa, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, is where, you're, where these are really a problem. It's not as much of a problem in this country. In this country, the major place where you see these, these kinds of infections is in amongst uh, on Indian reservations, basically. Uh, but other than that, it's not, this, these are not major problems. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why they get that. Um, okay, and it is primarily an infection of children. We we get exposed to this uh, in, in, as children, and, and again, because we don't develop immunity, either a chronic infection is established, or what happens is you just keep get repeating, we get infected and infected and infected since we don't develop immunity, and then eventually, uh, there's enough tissue damage that we have problems. And the way this organism is transmitted, it can be transmitted in a number of ways. In droplets, remember, what we're transmitting is that elementary body, that spore-like thing that's pretty resistant. So it can be uh, transmitted by droplets. It can be tr transmitted by hands. You know, the, kid's a kid, the kid that's infected goes ahead and rubs his eye and then touches you know, hand with some friend, and they transfer that elementary body. The, the, the friend just goes ahead and touches his eye or her eye and transmits the organism. So that's a common way. Uh, contaminated clothing. These these are spore-like. They're they're resistant. So any clothing that gets contaminated, somebody else comes in contact with that clothing, we can transmit that way. These flies, you know, these little gnats that bother you all the time, flying around, and, and they always seem to like your eye, and they'll land in somebody's eye that's got infected, and then fly off and and, and transmit the infection to somebody else. And in the cases of children, neonates that are born, they, and neonates born through a, a contaminated birth canal will also obviously get infected this way. So there's a number of different ways that this organism can be transmitted. Yeah. Obviously, the way we, you see, some of these infections are, what we'll, we'll cover our, our, our genital tract infections. And it's those infections, those genital chlamydia that actually get transmitted to the newborn. So, but, but the mother won't have it. In, in the, birth canal, the, the child gets infer, infected at birth. The mother has it in her, in, her gen, uh, in her genital tract, okay? And then the child picks it up when it is born, okay? Uh, all right, so a little bit of the epidemiology of the, you know, we talked about the eye infections, now the genital infections, genital tract. And we'll again first talk about the trachoma biovar of these organisms. This is the biggie. This is the most common sexually transmitted disease in this country, is chlamydial infections. Okay? Uh, and this just gives you some of the statistics over the last three years, the number of cases in the United States and the number of cases in South Carolina. All right, so we're talking about a major infection. And worldwide, it's estimated that there's probably about 50 million cases a year. So this is the biggie. This is the major sexually transmitted disease. Now, as far as the LGB, LGV biovar, which causes the lymphogranuloma venereum, humans are the only natural host for this organism. And, and we don't see this much in this country. Uh, it's primarily in Africa, Asia, and South America where you see the, the, this, this infection. We do see it occasionally in this country, and these are some statistics uh, of maybe three to 500 cases a year. And the primary reservoir appears to be male homosexuals in this country, but in other, part, in other parts of the world, this is more of a problem. All right, let's take our break here, and then we'll come up and start talking about the actual diseases. <laughs>